when Luke writes and he begins Acts and Luke, he begins with a very strong affirmation, something very, very strong. And I want us to look, as we look at the book of Acts, so Sarah, I'm going to be skipping because I'm looking at the time, some things, so she'll keep up, she'll do a good job of that. We see as we go into, when we read the Gospel of Luke and when we read the book of Acts as well, we see great Christians. We see people that really inspire us. And we see people that we look, wow, I, I could never be like that person. But I want to encourage you as we really get into our study of Acts that the people that we meet in Luke and in Acts as well are people just like you and they're people just like me. They're not some sort of special holy saint that floats above the ground. These are people like you and I. They're just like we are. If God had chosen special people only to do his work, you and I would really be left out, wouldn't we? Because God loves us and we're serving him, but most of us, if we look at ourselves, we think, well, I'm not particularly special. I'm not particularly talented. Maybe we look at some of our missionaries in the Philippines and we think, yeah, but you know, Pastor, Pastor Rowena, she's really special. Or Pastor Amor, or Pastor Vivian up there with the tribes at the top of the mountain. Now they're really special. And what I want to say to you is this. I remember Pastor Vivian when she was just like you. I remember Pastor Rowena when she was just like you. When Vivian was part of Lighthouse, she couldn't even come on Sunday mornings because she had to work. She came on Wednesday evenings. And you know what? She almost didn't speak much English. When we would read the scripture, and we'd go around, you know, person by person on Wednesday nights, she would stumble over the words and she'd laugh and she'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she was, I'm not making fun of her. I'm just, tell, I'm just telling you, this is what Vivian was like. And she would be embarrassed and sometimes she would say, skip me and she'd let somebody else read it. And she wouldn't say very much. I don't think she had, has a lot of education. I'm not sure, but it doesn't seem that way. But what I want to say to you is this, we look at Vivian now and the work that she's doing in the Philippines with so many people and how God has used her. And what we see is a person whose life has been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Same thing with, with Rowena. I remember Rowena sitting in our office one time looking at some things and, and showing us some books and they were just false doctrine. I mean really heresy. And somebody had given it to her and she was reading it and she was whatever. And that was in the early days. That was in the beginning days when she had just become a Christian. Look at her now. And you're looking at the life of somebody who's transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke and Acts show us people transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what we read in these pages is not just history from more than 2,000 years ago. What we read in these pages is available to us, is promised to us. It is what God wants to give us and it is what God wants from us as we follow Him and as we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and as our lives overflow with the fullness of the Spirit. So as we come into Luke and as we come into Acts, and Acts is what we're going to focus on, I want us to see what Luke says about faith and the foundation for the Christian lives that we have. Let's look at the first one. Luke makes it very clear. Let's look at the next slide. Luke makes it very clear. Stay with me. You with me? Okay. Luke makes it very clear he's not giving his, just his opinion. He makes it very clear he's not just saying, hey, I heard about this and I thought you might be interested in this. Luke is not giving rumors. Luke is not just giving hearsay. Oh, somebody said this and they told it to somebody else and then I heard it. And hey, I want you to know this as well. Look at what Luke says in the beginning of Luke and the beginning of Acts. He says, I have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, the lover of God or the friend of God, that's what it means, so that you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So that's why he begins to write Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And then in Acts, what does he say? 
after suffering, he wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And then verse 3, after his suffering, that means his crucifixion, he showed himself to these men and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. I want you to look at these two verses here and here. When Luke writes, he's writing for them and he's writing for us. And he wants them to know and he wants you to know that what you believe you can count on. That what you believe has a foundation. There is a foundation for your faith in the Word of God and in your relationship with God. Do you know what drives me crazy sometimes? Really, just drives me crazy. I talk with people sometimes and you know what they say? They say, oh, well, you believe in God and that, well, that's good for you. Have you ever, has somebody ever said that to you before? Well, I'm so glad you believe that. I'm glad you have a belief. Have you ever heard somebody say that? I'm so glad you have a belief. It helps you and it gives you comfort. And honestly, brothers and sisters, <laughs> I don't know how to react when I hear that. I want to hit them, first of all, in love. <laughs> But what I want to say to them, and sometimes I do, is it's not just a belief. It's not just, oh, it's something good for you. It's good that you have that so you can feel better about it. It will give you comfort if you, if you believe in that in this world, as if it's just a feeling that you and I have, as if you and I have just grabbed a nice story somewhere and we've said, oh, okay, this makes me feel better. Luke wants us to know that what he's writing about and what he's telling us about Jesus is a foundation for our faith. These people are going to have to know that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he rose again. First of all, because they're going to have to believe it for themselves. And secondly, they're going to have to know that they know that they know because Jesus is calling them to go out into a world that is skeptical, that is hostile and that is unbelieving and they are going to have to proclaim this truth. They're going to have to proclaim these things to people who don't believe. They're going to have to proclaim these things to people who have all sorts of questions, to people who are going to say, well, how do you know that? To people who will say, well, nobody else has ever risen from the dead before. To people who will say, oh, yeah, I heard about that Jesus, but you know what I heard? I heard that the disciples actually stole his body from the tomb. And then they said he rose from the dead. Because you know what? That's what the Jewish leaders said, didn't they? They said, listen, they bribed the soldiers and they said, tell everybody that the disciples came and while you were sleeping, they stole his body. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. If you are skeptical this morning or if you have questions yourself about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you just to think about it for a little bit. When you start thinking about it and you think about that story, that's the most ridiculous story ever. There are Roman soldiers outside that are standing there. If the body disappears, the Roman soldiers will be put to death. That was the Roman law. And what do they do? They fall asleep, don't they? So they fall asleep, and then the disciples come in, they roll the stone away, and they take the body. The soldiers are outside, and at any minute they could come in and catch them. But what do the disciples stop to do? They stop to take all of the clothes, all of the, dead, the death clothes, the wrapping things that Jesus has wrapped around him. They take all of them, they take them off his body, and then they take time while the soldiers are outside then to wrap everything and fold them and put them right back there again. How ridiculous is that? How ridiculous is that? And brothers and sisters, that's just a small thing. That's just a small thing. There are so many more things. And you and I, just as the disciples then, would have to be convinced and would have to know that what they believe in is true. That there is proof for it. They're going to give up their homes for this. Some of them are going to give up their families for this. They're going to give up the riches of the world 
for this. They're going to give up their jobs for this. And some of them are going to give their lives for this. They have to know that they know that they know. And so Jesus gives convincing proof to the disciples for two reasons. First of all, so that they will believe for themselves. And secondly, so that they will have a message to proclaim to an unbelieving and hostile world. Turn to the next slide. So the foundation for faith, what do we see? Look again at the verse. Okay, next click. He gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Many convincing proofs. We as his disciples are going to have to be convinced of the truth of Jesus in our heads. And we're going to have to experience his transforming power in our lives. By the way, I see some of you writing and looking and you want to make sure you get the right answer, don't you? On your piece of paper, let me tell you what. If you, if you get a little bit lost or you're not sure what to write, I'm going to put my notes up here at the end of the service, okay? And you can come and look for yourself. Um, it's, this is just to help you as you go along, but if it's distracting to you, you can do it later. Don't worry about it. We'll come back, we'll come back to it. But anyhow, so here we see many convincing proofs, many convincing proofs, okay? What do we see next? Look at the word proof. The word proof, those of you that are, are uh, analytical and like to keep facts and things like that, the word proof that's used here in the New Testament means demonstrated decisive evidence. When Luke writes, remember what I told you? Luke is a man of science and he's highly educated and his Greek is good. His Greek is the best Greek in the New Testament, much better than Paul's, and Paul had really good Greek. Luke's Greek was as good as the classical writers of his day, and he uses his skill inspired by God, and the words he chooses are important words, and so he chooses this word that means demonstrated, decisive evidence. You can count on it. You can believe it. Remember, he's a man of science. He's meticulous. He's careful. Remember in the book of Acts, how many place names does Luke use? More than what? We talked about it last week. More than? More than a hundred. How many personal names? More than a hundred also. He takes facts and details and he's accurate with them. When we read the book of Acts, we're not Greek scholars, but in the Greek what we find out is this. Luke got a lot of his information from eyewitness accounts themselves. When he, he, when he was with Paul, he met some of the people that these things happened to. Remember Philip the evangelist? that was walking on the road with the Ethiopian, and the Ethiopian eunuch came up in the cart, and Philip heard him speaking, and he walked up, the spirit said, go, go walk beside him. And he begins to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he says, I'm reading from the book of Isaiah, I don't understand it, what does this mean? He invites Philip up in the, in the chariot, Philip speaks to him, and then he's baptized, and what does the Spirit do? He takes Philip away. Now, I want to ask you something, brothers and sisters. How does Luke know that story? How does Luke know that story? Does somebody tell somebody, tell somebody, tell somebody, and finally says, oh yeah, I heard this story. Let me write it down. That's a really exciting story to include in the book of Acts. You know, it's kind of a miracle, right? And then the Spirit transports him. Wow. Let's be sure to include that. No. If you read the book of Acts, you know what you will find out? As Luke is a companion of Acts, at one point later in the book of Acts, Luke stays in the home of... Who's home? Philip, the evangelist. Luke got that story from Philip himself, who was there. Remember a little bit later when Paul is shipwrecked and he swims ashore and they're all wet and cold and they take, they take wood and they build it up and they make a fire and then a snake comes out of the wood and bites a poisonous snake. Christine, aren't we glad for the hospital that's, that helped to save Andrew's life? There was no hospital in the time of Paul and that poisonous snake bit him on the hand just like Andrew. That, that cobra right on his hand, bit, bit Paul on the hand. Remember what Paul does? He shakes it off and he keeps on doing his thing. Everyone says, oh, and because of that, 
because of that, doors open to the gospel on the island of Malta. How does Luke know that? Did Paul tell him? No. If you read the book of Acts, you will find out Luke himself, the doctor, was shipwrecked. He had to swim through the surf and through the water and get on the shore and stood around the fire cold and wet and saw with his own eyes the snake that bit Paul on the hand and the miraculous power that preserved Paul's life. Dr. Luke is giving proofs of the truth of Jesus. And you and I have to have those proofs as well because we face the same things that they face as well. What do we see here? We, re we read here that after his suffering, he appeared from time to time. Then we looked at the word proof. And then what do we see next? What are some of the proofs? Number one, he appeared to them. So on your page, some convincing proofs are what? He appeared to them. Okay, let me ask you. Let me get some feedback from you. What are some of the times that Jesus appeared after his resurrection? Just raise your hand and call it out in a good loud voice. Anybody. We have about 10 or 11 choices. DJ, you're first. The two men on the road, the two men on the road to Emmaus. Okay, so he appeared to them. He gave proof. Okay, think about that, DJ. Jesus was not floating along like some ghostly spirit. What did he do? He walked. He walked on the road with them. Okay, somebody else. What was another appearance? What was another proof, an, an appearance? Anybody? Oh, uh, 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 and then, okay, Juliet. Uh, when? Inside the room that night. They were behind closed doors and he appeared and all of them saw him. Okay, somebody else. Another appearance. Okay, Miss May. Ah, when the, when the disciples went back up to Galilee and they were fishing and Jesus in the early morning hours was on the seaside. And what did he do? You know, this is what I love. It's not just real spiritual things. What did Jesus do for them? He did what May often does for people. He prepared food for them. He had fish that he broiled and some bread that he had baked or had gotten from somewhere and he prepared it for them. Okay, Julie, you raised your hand. It may took yours. Okay. <laughs> Miss. To Mary in the garden. We missed that one, didn't we? That was the very first appearance. To Mary Magdalene. I like, I, I like that one. Any others that you can think of? There are many, many more. If you sit down and list it, there are 10 or 11 recorded appearances. And if you read in 1 Corinthians uh, a little bit later on, you know what Paul says? Paul says what he heard was at one time Jesus appeared to more than 500 at once. 500 at one time and others as well. And so what did Jesus do? Convincing proofs. He appeared to them. He appeared to them. Sometimes we can think, I think I see it, but I'm not sure. Jesus wanted them to know I'm not a figment of your imagination. It's not a hallucination. It's not a strong desire. Oh, we wish we could. It's not a, oh, I think I see a ghost of Jesus. Because sometimes they would think when somebody had died that they would see the ghost or they would see the angel of the person. That was, some, that was a Jewish belief at that time. Jesus wants them them to know I am alive. There's got to be a foundation for their faith. What is another convincing proof? Proof. He appeared to them. Number two, he spoke to them. He spoke to them. He wanted them to hear his voice. It wasn't, ooh. He spoke to them with words, with words. He wanted them to know that he was alive. It wasn't a thought in their mind. How many of you have before as you've prayed, as the Lord has, has, has led you, you have, felt, you have felt the impression of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, that you haven't heard with your ear, but you felt it so strongly in your heart you knew it was God. Have you felt that before? Sure, all of us have. Now, the Holy Spirit does that, but Jesus took it beyond that in those early stages. He spoke to them and they heard his voice. What was one more convincing proof that he gave them? He gave them three types of convincing proofs. Number one, he appeared to them. 
Number two, he spoke to them. Number three, what did he do? This is the most practical one. This is the most physical one. Number three, he ate with them. He ate with them. That's the most, that's the most physical. Does that make sense to you? He ate with them because, you know, if you're a ghost, you don't eat, do you? You don't eat. And by the way, and I'm, I'm, I'm not making fun of the disciples or of Jesus because Jesus talks about that. In fact, look at the next verse. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Go, back, go on to the next, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, in Luke 24, 37 through 43, he talks about that. When he appears, he says, why are you troubled? Look at verse 37. They thought they saw a ghost. He says, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Now, brothers and sisters, that also tells us something about the glorified bodies. We're going to have one day, doesn't it? And we don't have time to talk about that this morning. But that tells us something about the body on the day of redemption. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago. The day of redemption, the type of body you're going to have. You think you're going to float around like a whoo. You're not. You're not. The Bible's very clear about that. Look at the type of body that Jesus had. It's a glorified body. Guess what? That's the type of body you're going to have and I'm going to have. Jesus went there first. Jesus received it first. He received the full inheritance. He went ahead of us. So he shows us what's going to be ours as well. But he says, what does he say? Then they still couldn't believe it because of joy and amazement. And he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Verse 42, they gave him, I like this. You know what? What they could have said was, they gave him something to eat. But you know what's great? They gave him, gave him a piece of what? Broiled fish. So specific, isn't it? So specific. It was fish and this was how it was prepared. Okay, a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. It's a convincing proof. And it's interesting when you look at it, if you read other resurrection appearances of Jesus, do you know how many times the, the appearance of Jesus is associated with a meal, with food? Several times. It was a convincing proof. He's alive. He's alive. In fact, in Acts 1, 4, it says once when he was eating with them, he said, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised as I told you before. They saw him, brothers and sisters, take food, put it in his mouth, chew it, and swallow it. Jesus was alive. Jesus was alive. Now, some of you are wondering, Pastor Jennifer, why are you spending so much time talking about that? Because it was what they needed to know, to know that they know that they know Jesus is alive. Everything he said is true. They believed it for themselves. And because they believed it for themselves, and because they were so convinced for themselves, they then had a foundation to be witnesses in the world. I think sometimes you and I are probably not very convincing witnesses because we're not very sure ourselves, are we? When we sometimes, let me, for example, sometimes we want to tell somebody, God loves you. And yet in our own hearts and lives, we're struggling with that, aren't we? God, do you really love me? And so you say to somebody, God loves you. And maybe that person has had a terrible day and tragedy has just struck them. Do you know what that person is going to say if you say to them, God loves you? I can tell you what he's going to say. Don't talk to me about the love of God. My heart has been broken and my family's been destroyed. Don't even say a lie like that. That's the answer that you will get. That's the nicest answer you will get. You'll probably get worse. Brothers and sisters, you and I, in our hearts and in our heads, have to know that we know that we know the love of God, the truth of Jesus, the power of Jesus to transform a life. You and I are going to meet people sometimes that are, that are skeptical and unbelieving. But more than that, you and I are also going to meet people who are hopeless and desperate 
I have nowhere else to turn. What am I going to do? My life is a mess. All of my choices are bad choices. I have nowhere to turn. And brothers and sisters, when you and I meet those people, and believe me, God wants us to meet those people. God directs us to those people. God arranges our paths so that they cross the paths of those people because he does love them and he does want them to know him. When our paths cross those people, you have to know you have to be convinced. You have to have it in your head and in your heart. I've told you the story before of my sister who had a, her car broke down. It was a flat tire. Her car broke down or something. This was about four or five years ago um, back in my hometown. And she was, it, was the, it was during rush hour. She was so frustrated. She was so frustrated that it happened. And nobody stopped. And she kept on trying to get a motorist. And we live in a small town, a, a fairly small town maybe 27,000 people. That's pretty small, right? Compared to Hong Kong, 7, 8 million. And she kept on trying to get somebody to stop and nobody would stop. And finally, she looked and she crossed the road and there was a, there was a, a it was a car dealership or a garage or something like that. I don't remember all the details now, across the road. And so she walked over there to get help. And when she walked in, she started talking with a guy behind the counter. And as he talked, he made it very clear to her there's no hope for my life, and tonight when I'm going to go home, I'm going to end my life. That's what he told her. The story, it was, it was after hours, he was the only one that was there, and I've told you that before. And because she knew that she knew that she knew, and she knew that God loved her, loved her, she knew that God loved him. Because she knew God has a good plan for my life. She knew that God had a good plan for his life, and she was able to talk to him about Jesus, and he did not take his life. He did not end it and go to hell, but God preserved his life. You talked to Julie after the service. She told, she just got back from the U.S., and she told me the story of, of um, meeting someone on the airplane in the U.S. when her seat had been moved, and the woman came, and then they found out that they had 25, 30 years ago, had gone to the same elementary school, had gone to the same elementary school, and this woman was absol absolutely not a Christian. Absolutely not a Christian. And Julie said to her, you realize that God did this, don't you? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Brothers and sisters, you and I must have a foundation for our faith. We've got to have a foundation for our faith because God calls us to be his witnesses. And I'm going to jump ahead because our time is, is coming to the end. And when we come back to this, you say, but Pastor Jennifer, there are, all these, there are all these notes we haven't gotten to yet. We'll get to them the next time we come back. But in Acts 1.8, go ahead and move forward to that one, Sarah. That's slide number, there we go. In Acts 1.8, Jesus tells his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. Brothers and sisters, we've got to know that we know that we know. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and when the Holy Spirit fills us, he makes it real to our heads and to our hearts. And we know that we know. And when we do, there will be an overflow in our lives, that our lives are witnesses to people around us, that there will be an overflow. And then when we talk with people, when we talk with family members, that there will be something in our hearts, there will be something in our lives, there will be something in our words that convinces them this is true this is real this is no joke they're not just making up a story they won't be able to say to you well I'm glad you have something you can believe in that makes you feel better about life they won't be able to say that they will know that what they're seeing in your life 
They will know that what they're hearing from your mouth is truth, that it is convincing proof. Jesus ro rose from the dead. It's been more than 2,000 years ago. But when you and I are his witnesses, let me tell you what will happen. People will look at your life. People will listen to your words. And in your life and in your words, they will see the life of the risen Lord. It's not just a nice belief that will make us feel better, that will change other people's lives and bring them to God. It will be the life of a living God through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. Some of you this morning, as we come to a close, some of you this morning, you have family members that you've been praying for and you want them to know Jesus and you've been praying, maybe you've been praying, God, give me the words to say to them. And God can use words, God can use words, but I want to encourage you this morning, rather than saying, God, give me the right words to say to them, I encourage you with family and friends and others that you are around that have not yet come to Jesus, although you are praying for them, although you're talking with them, I encourage you to start praying a different way. Start praying this way instead. Oh, Jesus, may your Holy Spirit come upon me and fill me in such a way that your power will overflow in my life and I will be a witness for you. Pray that way. Pray that God will so transform your thoughts and your mind and your heart that when you are with your family and with your friends and you're with others that they cannot help but see a life transformed. Now that will be convincing proof, won't it? That will be convincing proof. Do you know when Paul became a Christian, do you know what one of the great convincing proofs was to many, many people about the life of Paul? It wasn't so much what he said. It was, he used to be a murderer. He persecuted the church of God. And look at him now. His life has been transformed. It is a life transformed that will convince people. It's a life transformed. And the power of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the Holy Spirit is available to you and to me for just that purpose. For just that purpose. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer this morning. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we come to you this morning. We come to you this morning. And Father, I just come to you as a pastor. Lord, you know that there wasn't a lot of time this morning, and there were so many things going on in the first part of the service. But Lord, we come to you. We ask you to do in our lives and in our hearts what you did, what you did for those early disciples who transformed and revolutionized the world because they were convinced of the truth and the proof of your resurrection. Lord, may we 2,000 plus years later have lives that are transformed by the power of your spirit and that our lives are proof of a living Lord and a risen Savior through the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.